Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to apply some of the skills we know from pre-calculus and calculus, and as well as a little technology, to examine the class of normal probability distribution functions. So the PDF for normal distribution is going to have a formula that looks like this. Uh, PDF of x, or f of x, equals 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi times e to the power and the opposite of x minus mu in parentheses squared over 2 sigma squared here. Mu and sigma are um, constants, parameters. Mu is a real number and sigma is a positive number. Um, these, it turns out that mu is what we call the mean of the distribution and sigma is what we call the standard deviation of the distribution. So if you know a little bit about statistics, you'll know a little bit about what those things mean. And we'll see a little bit as we go along kind of what they mean as we uh, analyze this. Now, these are the, these graph the probability density function of what's called a normal probability distribution. The normal probability distribution is, is the single most important probability distribution. And probability in statistics, uh, this is a very, very important distribution. And probability in statistics are basically everywhere. So this turns out to be one of the most important functions in mathematics. One of the reasons why this is so important is because relative frequencies of a wide variety of measurements very closely follow this type of a normal curve or approximated well by this normal curve, including things like uh, heights and weights, lifespans, uh, measures of intelligence, even test some standardized test scores if they have large numbers of people such as the ACT and SAT and so forth uh, have fit a normal curve uh, quite well. And one thing that's very important in the study of what's called inferential statistics and inferential statistics is a process of making valid generalizations from a, about an entire population based on measurements of a small test sample. Uh, one of the things that's very important is something called the central limit theorem that says that the samples of normally uh, that means of samples are uh, at least approximately normally distributed about the mean of the population and so because of these things this particular distribution is very important in mathematics so again here's the basic formula for it right here and uh, the standard normal distribution is sort of the simplest version where you let mu be 0, so this just becomes x squared for this numerator right here, and you let sigma be 1, so this denominator is just 2, and then this, this, this you essentially erase the mu's and sigma's then. And if you graph that particular one, here's what it looks like. Notice it's zoomed in pretty closely on the vertical scale, but we get what's called a normal curve or a bell-shaped curve. See some of the characteristics of that? Uh, horizontal asymptotes on the left and right. It's always positive for the y's. It increases up to a maximum right at 0 for x and then just a little less than 0.4 and then it comes down, has a horizontal asymptote over here. It's increasing concave up to begin with, actually right at negative 1, has an inflection point, then it goes concave down for a while, increases up to max, then it's decreasing concave down, another inflection point at positive 1, and from there on out, it's decreasing concave up. The y values are all positive. So, uh, well, anyway, this is this is kind of what we see here. And let's see if we can can uh, prove some of those things we've seen and generalize that. So we're going to use some pre-calculus and calculus to do this. So first of all, uh, notice that, well, first of all, just look at the formula here without the limit. Sigma is always positive, so this coefficient here is positive. E to any power is positive, so that right there tells you that the y values are strictly positive, making our graph only a first and second quadrant graph. Okay, take the limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity, then this x minus mu goes to either positive or negative infinity, but when we square it, that goes to positive infinity. Sigma is positive. And, but this is a negative here, so that makes the power go to negative infinity, which means e going to, to the power of negative infinity goes toward 0 times this coefficient goes to 0. So we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0 on both sides, both as you go to infinity or negative infinity, 
So you do, in general, not just for this for this standard normal, but for all the normals, have a horizontal asymptote of the x-axis on both sides. Now let's compute the derivative. So there's the original function, the derivative sign in front. This, all of this is a constant. So when you're working with these families of functions, you have to keep track of what's a variable and what's a constant. In this case, the sigma is a constant, of course pi is a constant, 2 is a constant. This little part right here, this fraction, is a constant, so it can be brought out front. And then we're basically just doing the derivative of e to the v, where v is this power. Well, the derivative of e to the v is e to the v times the derivative of the v. So I'm just going to leave that e to the v for the moment. Still got our coefficient out front. The v we can think of is uh, the opposite of w squared over 2 sigma squared, where w is x minus mu. So then this, the 1 over minus, negative 1 over 2 sigma squared is a constant, so that can be brought up front. This is just a polynomial, so we say 2 times that, which cancels this 2. These 2 will cancel, which I've done in here. And then the power goes down to 1, but then you'd have to take the derivative of the w. Well, the derivative of x minus mu is just, just, just 1. So this part's 1 for this derivative. The w here is x minus mu. The sigma square I can put with that sigma and make sigma cubed. Uh, and then there's e to the v. v was this power. So it's basically like the original one here, but now this went up to sigma cubed instead of sigma. And then we have this other factor of x minus mu in it. So there's the derivative. Now, one of the things, why, why do we want to know the derivative? Well, the derivative tells us the direction of the curve, of the original curve, and it's going to identify any extrema. So notice that this coefficient here is positive. That negative makes it now negative. The e to a power is positive. So this whole thing right here is negative. And then it depends on what this x minus mu does. So if x is bigger than mu, uh, the whole thing turns out to be, to be negative. So let's see if I said that right. When x is greater than mu, the derivative is, uh, is negative. That's good. And if x is less than mu, this factor is negative. That's negative. The whole thing is positive. And so uh, the first derivative is positive when the, when the x is less than mu. So when x is less than mu, the function is increasing. And when x is greater than mu, the function is decreasing. So it's increasing on the left. And then it comes back down on the right. And it maxes out at whatever mu is. This one mu is 0. But in general, the maximum will happen when wherever mu is. And look, look, look at some examples below. Here's several examples right here for different mu's. And each time, the maximum happens at the value of whatever mu is. OK, so let's not get ahead of myself too much here. OK, uh, what are the coordinates of that maximum? Well, if it's increasing and then decreasing, it has a derivative of 0 in the middle, that's going to be a maximum point. And that happens right at mu. And if you plug in mu into the original formula, here it is, it goes in here. Well, mu minus mu is 0. 0 squared is 0. 0 divided by all this, change the sign, it's still 0. Either 0 is 1. And so this coefficient is the, uh, the y-coordinate of that uh, maximum. So notice it always happens at mu, which is the center of the distribution, the mean, and the the uh, for the x-coordinate, and the y-coordinate is is this, and it's uh, it, it depends on the value of sigma. The bigger sigma is, the the smaller or the smaller that uh, or the further down, closer to the x-axis is that maximum, and the uh, smaller sigma is the further up that maximum goes. Now, in, another thing, just to, more basically, the derivative is actually defined no matter what x is. So that means the original graph is continuous and smooth with the domain of both the original function and the derivative being all reals. And in fact, we can continue to take second derivative, third derivative, and so forth. So it's actually an infinitely differentiable function. In particular, let's calculate the second derivative. So this is the first derivative in the parentheses, and we want to take the derivative of that. Once again, this stuff out here is a constant. So I'm going to bring it out front using the constant multiple rule. The opposite of 1 over sigma squared times square root of 2 pi. 
Then take the derivative of what's left. This is e to the v times x minus mu with the same v we substituted before, v being the power. Now I'm going to have to use the product rule on this, so it's the first times derivative of the second plus the second times derivative of the first. The derivative of the x minus mu is just 1. The derivative of e to the v is e to the v times the derivative of the v. The derivative of the v, uh, we did this a while ago. Uh, v is, this is like w minus 1 over 2 sigma squared times w squared, which is um, 2, uh, which cancels that out. 2 times this cancels out the 2 there. So you get w to the first power. Then you take the derivative of the w, which is 1. And so we're at this point right here, and let's simplify a little bit. That cancels. These are the same factors, so I can make that a square. That minus changes that to uh, a plus to subtraction. And so we get this. And what I did here is I factored out a 1 over sigma square, making a sigma square here and getting rid of the sigma square here. That 1 over sigma square I put with this sigma cube and made this sigma to the fifth. So there is the second derivative. Now it's defined for all real numbers. When is it equal to zero? Well, all of this stuff in the front, well, this is positive, this part's positive, that negative makes the whole thing negative in the front. And so we need to look at this, this uh, expression here. The only part that could be zero is this part right here. So we set that equal to zero. And let's see, I added this, this uh, x minus mu squared term to both sides like this. Took a square root of both sides, but, but that gives you an absolute value um, on the left, which means it's going to give you plus or minus here when we do it this way. And so we get x equals mu plus or minus sigma. And if we want to figure out what, uh, what that is, if we want to evaluate the function, which I was calling f, at that point, we put it in here that the the mu's cancel. Whether it's positive or negative sigma, you square it, you still get sigma squared, which is going to cancel with the one in the denominator. And so we get this with either negative one half. Either negative one half is one over square root of e, which I can bring inside that square root, and you get one over the sigma times the square root of two pi e. So notice that the x coordinate of the maximum was this without the e there, and put the e in there for the x. I mean, the y-coordinate of the maximum is this without the e there. And the y-coordinate of the inflection point has that e in there as well. So where do they happen? They hap the, the inflection points happen uh, on both sides of that mean uh, exactly uh, at one standard deviation to the right of the mean and one standard deviation to the left of the mean. Also notice that the higher the sigma value is, the further, the lower that that uh, y coordinate of that inflection point. In fact, in general, all when you when you we'll see in just a minute, whenever you um, increase, let's see, de, let's see, yeah, increase the value of sigma, the whole graph gets lower, except for uh, a, a couple of points. Okay, and so we can summarize that here. So sometimes we'll use a table like this, where these are x values here, but not just specific x values. Well, some of them are specific. This one, this one, and this one. And the others are you know, intervals of x's. So if all the x's going from negative infinity to mu minus sigma, the function is positive, the derivative is positive, and the second derivative is positive. So it's increasing concave up. With, and it actually has an asymptote on the, right, on the left side. When you specifically get to mu minus sigma, this is the specific y value that goes with that. At that point, the derivative is positive, so the function is still increasing, but the second derivative is, net, is zero, so that's an inflection point. Then when you go between x's between mu minus sigma and mu, the function is positive, the derivative is positive, but the second derivative is negative, so the function is increasing but concave down there. Then when you get to x equals mu, this is the y that goes with that, the derivative is zero, second derivative is negative, so that's a actually a global as well as local maximum. And the function is concave down there, of course. When you go between mu and mu plus sigma, the y values are positive, they're, they're always positive everywhere. The derivative is negative and the second derivative is negative, so it's decreasing concave down. 
You get to mu plus sigma, here's the y that goes with that. That's an inflection point because the, the first derivative is zero, the second derivative is, first derivative is negative, second derivative is zero. So it's decreasing at an inflection point. And then from mu plus sigma on out to the right forever, uh, the function's positive, the derivative's negative, the second derivative's positive. So, it's, so the original function is decreasing concave up from there on out. So you can sort of illustrate this. This is still the graph of the standard normal. And notice you got your concave up increasing here. We get an inflection point at mu minus one sig standard deviation, which is right here. Then it switches to concave down, but increasing to a local maximum here when x is mu. Then it decreases from there, concave down to the inflection point right here, mu plus sigma for the x. And then it continues to decrease, but now it's concave up from there on out with an asymptote on this side. So that's, get, that's what gives you this bell-shaped uh, curve that we've talked about. Now here is a particular one uh, where I let the mean be uh, 5 and sigma is uh, 2. So the mean is 5, the standard deviation is 2. And then you get this blue graph, which is very similar. The center is centered up at 5. It's actually symmetric about that. I'll prove that in just a minute. And uh, that's where the maximum occurs as well. And so uh, there we get our basic shape. Still the basic kind of shape that we got going there. The inflection points would be at mu minus sigma. So it's 5 minus 2 is 3. So right here is where the inflection point is. And then also the other one is at mu plus sigma. So 5 plus 2 is 7. So that's right here. Now, of course, where, what else should you see at that inflection point? Well, at that same x value, we should see the second derivative is 0, which is the green one there. And the, and the first derivative is at an extremum there. First derivative is at a maximum here where the second derivative is 0, and the first original function has an inflection point. And, of course, we have the maximum right here where the first derivative is 0. Okay, and so, of course, what you know about derivatives you should have probably been able to uh, figure out at least roughly what this shape was going to be just by looking at the shapes here. Now let's recall in general that if we replace x by x minus h for some constant h, the graph of relation is shifted horizontally absolute value of h units to the right if h is positive and to the left if h is negative. So changing the value of mu in the PDF formula get back to the formula here it is is like taking the standard normal and replacing x by x minus mu so that's going to just give us a horizontal shift and sure enough that's what we see here here I've graphed several different ones with different means and notice that the maximum occurs at mu each time these are just horizontal shifts of each other. Now remember a function is even if f of opposite of x equals f of x. So the standard normal is an even function, which has, means it's symmetric about the y-axis, which is the mean, symmetric about 0, the mean. So here uh, we see that by doing uh, f of the opposite of x. And that is, it's this formula with, that's the standard normal formula. Sigma is, z, is uh, 1 and mu is 0. And I replace x by minus x. Well, you square it, you just get x squared there. And that's the same as the original, the original f of x. So by definition, that's an even function, which means it has origin, uh, or excuse me, y-axis symmetry. Now, um, Furthermore, any time mu is 0, this is true too, so not just with the standard normal. Here I did it with another one, but uh, this b should be sigma. And I can have any sigma that I want here. It doesn't matter. We still get f of the opposite of x is the same as f of x as long as the mu is 0. And so that has, that has uh, symmetry with respect to the uh, to, with the with the y-axis, okay. But because of the the all of these uh, up here are just shifts of that horizontally, any normal function, normal PDF curve, 
has symmetry about a vertical line at x equals mu, x equals the mean. So all of these are symmetric about the mean. Now, if you study a little bit about probability functions, that means that this will end up being not only the mean, but it will also be the median. And we've also seen that it's the mode. The mode is where the maximum is on a, on a PDF. So it's the mode. And it's also the mean because that's the, the mean basically means it's the average. So it's it, one way to interpret that is, is if you sort of shade it in that area below the curve and try to balance it, the balance point would be the mean. And it's the mode, it's the median because half of the uh, area underneath the curve is to the left and half is to the right of that point. And we can kind of get all of that really just from the symmetry and the fact that the high point happens at that symmetry point. All right, so changing mu changes the center of the distribution. So it just shifts it horizontally. What does changing sigma do? Well, changing sigma, you can see here, um, changes the shape a little bit. It's not exactly, um, well, it actually makes makes it a little, if you have a smaller sigma, here I'm using S for sigma, it's a little taller and skinnier. So more of the area under the curve is close to the center, to the mean. And of course you can do both these things. You can, you can uh, change sigma and mu. Now changing mu on these would just shift what we have here. So the red one is the standard normal. This one has a, S, a sigma of a half. Then here's a sigma of two, three, four, and five. And notice the larger we make sigma, the sort of the flatter it gets. And notice all of those points compared to the to the red one are all the uh, all actually uh, well between the two. Uh, it's shorter, at least between the two inflection points. Maybe I should say that. I don't think I said that right earlier. In fact, a higher value of signal result in the PDF graph is lower in height between the two inflection points. And of course, it'll be higher in height outside the two inflection points. Okay, uh, so a couple things to remember. Remember the global maximum we've already said occurs here at mu comma one over sigma times the square root of two pi. So this height at, height at this point is uh, as you increase sigma, you're decreasing this fraction. So it, that bears out on the on the picture here. The smaller sigma gives us a, a higher uh, maximum there. And the inflection points happen at mu plus sigma and, and mu minus sigma. And they have these values here. And notice the height at the inflection point is actually uh, lower for a higher sigma as well. Okay, so in our last unit in calculus, we w in calculus one, we will return to the family normal distributions a little bit as we make some connections between probability statistics and calculus. I also have, um, because of its importance in the study of probability statistics, you will find uh, several videos about the normal distribution in the uh, probability statistics uh, videos as well.